uh, differing doses of unlabeled antibody, uh, and, and noting that the distribution, biodistribution changed. So here's 35 milligrams of the radio-labeled material, and here's uh, uh, 150 milligrams injected, followed by 35 milligrams. So the, the extra unlabeled antibody had an effect on biodistribution. And I think one thing we're not doing too well right now is optimizing uh, masses to the biodistribution. With theragnostic, we actually have this stability, and there's a significant change in biodistribution here. In any case, in patients, I'll skip through it quickly, there was substantial variability from patient to patient in terms of the amount of administered radioactivity required to deliver a given radiation dose to the total body. This particular drug has a 75 centigrade total body dose. And the dose escalation with this particular agent was based on total body radiation dose predicted from a, a diagnostic or dosimetric dose. And was found in heavily pre-treated patients to be 75 centigrade. The drug was approved based on showing a better response rate um, 68% of patients who had failed rituximab therapy. So um, this was uh, uh, based on the response rate of previously treated patients. So the prior treatment used as a therapist. A little bit of unusual design. This was done after showing that the labeled material was more active than unlabeled rituximab. Uh, this is the indication that was present for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I might point out that um, while the first patient was treated in 1993, it took 10 years to get the drug approved. It was a very similar drug in class as Zeppelin, which is FDA uh, approved, and then the unlabeled antibody. Um, based on the early data, it was possible to conduct multi center prospective trials comparing uh, chemotherapy plus rituximab to chemotherapy alone to chemotherapy plus I'm with 31,000 And uh, I just wanted to show you this. Um, this is a 554 patient trial in the JCO. Uh, published in 2013. But what was interesting is that the 10-year um, uh, progression-free survival was, was significantly better for um, the radiation therapy consolidation as opposed to the Texanac. But I think one of the things is the survival curves overlap, and uh, it's safe to say that this was, while better, it wasn't dramatically better. Um, so then I'd like to switch to economics for a moment. Some of you may have heard of this gentleman called Willie Sutton, who was a famous bank robber in the United States. And they asked him why he robbed banks, and he said, because that's where the money is. And uh, one of the things when this therapy was developed uh, and marketed, uh, the, the cost of radiation therapy was about $25,000 for one dose for a patient. This was felt to be, at the time of the development, too expensive for a cancer uh, therapy. Um, and in addition, um, and this was over, this was the first generation, um, Medicare um, decided to pay less than the cost of the drug. So um, based on flawed data, Medicare in the U.S. decided to pay $16,000 for the drug, which was costing around $30,000. Um, so it was also pointed out that many other cancer therapies had payment uh, that were much higher. But some of the patients um, were very upset, and this was actually a front page article in the New York Times. Um, and here are, here are some of the patients who, uh, who became unable to get the drug, but who had good outcomes. In any case, um, there were some factors going on with Medicare paying less than the cost of an effective drug, and the, the manufacturer decided to discontinue manufacture of the agent in 2013. So this is a cautionary tale for theragnostics, and one that perhaps only could happen in the U.S. But um, the, the fact of the matter is, in the U.S., uh, patients were somehow lost by their oncologist when they had the radiopharmaceutical therapy. And in the U.S., the oncologist actually received revenue from their cancer chemotherapy drugs, so they would actually lose the revenue. In addition, at the time, Medicare was paying less than half the cost of the drug for therapy. And then they, Medicare also decided that the dosimetric dose uh, was a generic imaging agent. They didn't want to pay for that. Uh, and then uh, the therapy wasn't reimbursed like other cancer therapies. And one of the competitors, or one of the, one of the vendors in the field, had a non-radioactive competitor molecule. So this was first generation. But these are some of the cautionary issues that can occur when you introduce these to the market. There were also logistical issues that I think we may or may not face with other theranostics. I mean, this was a while ago. 
but patient-specific dose therapy was viewed as difficult. It was certainly out of the ordinary. Uh, high 131 therapy meant inpatient in some locales. Um, obviously, the shelf life was uh, short because of the half-life, raising the cost of goods. And oncologists couldn't give the therapy. So, um, the, the, anyway, so, so there were some issues. And the other thing, of course, was a first-generation drug was that this particular agent was only approved for single administrations. Uh, the GABA emitter would deliver off-target dose. And mild dysplastic syndromes were reported in some patients. In addition to lymphoma, there's quite a panoply of agents to choose from. Um, well, well, the frontline therapy was very effective with a 95% response rate. Uh, the company being sold never got that approval, despite the article uh, being published in the New England Journal of Medicine showing excellent uh, responses. So that's one uh, theranostic where it worked, but it's not on the market. Here's another agent. Um, we all know this is radium 23 and here's the improved survival with radium versus placebo in metastatic prostate cancer. Uh, this is about, um, about three months longer. Highly significant. Uh, I also point out that's available in the US, and of course we know that uh, SSTR2 targeting agents, uh, we've seen these graphs, uh, lutetium dotatate um, is available uh, here um, in the US, and we saw these curves of significant advances. And with these two drugs, shortly, let's say, within a year after the uh, XR went off the market, um, here, here are some figures that are quite interesting. Bayer acquired Algenta for $2.9 million in December of 2013. Novartis um, acquired AAA for $3.9 million in 2017 um, for neuroendocrine tumors. And quite recently, um, in, in December of, 19, of, of last year, Novartis uh, bought Indesign for $2.1 million, um, mainly for the Lutetium PSMA uh, success team. Interestingly, um, Indesign bought the drug from ABX for about $12 million. So um, it was pointed out that within one year, the uh, price paid for this asset, this Theranasi, was 200 fold higher. I know that this is supposed to be a medical talk, but I think that uh, you have to realize that these investments are large, and they clearly show that big uh, pharma is very interested in this therapy. And uh, um, the reason this is this is uh, so is in the U.S. oncologic drugs, uh, proprietary oncologic drugs, are richly reimbursed. Four doses of glutathera uh, in the U.S. costs list price of about two hundred thousand dollars. Zofingo in the U.S. Uh, is about 70,000 U.S. dollars for the drug. Uh, I-131 MIBG, uh, which you know about, um, invented in 1979, um, was finally approved by the FDA in 2018. I think that is almost uh, 40 years. Um, but this, this is uh, the approval for, it's called an ultra-orphan drug, um, but it is now approved in the U.S. And just for information, um, this is the headline uh, that uh, Protenix received approval for a $300,000 cancer fighting drug with a sticker price of $147,000 for a single dose. Um, this is uh, a couple of physician charges in the U.S. This is $300,000. Now, this, these, these are 10 times to 15 times higher than what uh, was considered too expensive a decade and a half earlier for I-131 uh, Tazakumumab. This is a, uh, I actually took this paper on the airplane, hence the bad quality, but this is the Wall Street Journal, which is a financial paper from the U.S., and uh, this was a, this was a picture from, uh, from Wednesday of this week, where Congress brought uh, drug executives of major companies to, uh, for a hearing about high prescription drug costs. So, right now, um, this, the, the payment for radiopharmaceutical Therapies in the U.S. is very high, um, uh, but there's a great deal, and, and this is attracting commercial interest. But there's great pressure that these may be unsustainably high. Okay, other issues in the U.S. I think are to to be or not to be. That is the dosimetry question: Should all require dosimetry? If so, when and how? Or is the biological readout of toxicity adequate? I mean, I, I think that what we've seen in terms of commercial success is that uh, perfect is perhaps the enemy of the good. 
that human geosymmetry um, may be uh, too much work for many sites. But the hope, of course, is that uh, one dose fits all, uh, or maybe you equate a patient and adjust the dose. But it's, it's infrequent for chemotherapy to have uh, dose adjustments uh, uh, based on drug levels, biological uh, readouts of the case. So the early deployments of radiation therapy um, did have uh, dose symmetry in part because of mouse antibodies, uh, because we could maybe only give one shot. Uh, but there was considerable variability, which I showed you. Um, but if, if yeah, I think we are facing an interesting point that for our field to mature, I think it's likely we will need more dose symmetry. Um, but I, I must point out, as was also pointed out, that intra-tumoral uh, heterogeneity is not addressed by current sort of macro dosimetry methods. Uh, so I think, I think we're still going to be asking, you know, what is the need and does dosimetry make a difference? It seems like we are, we have the need more, please. Uh, possibility to, uh, to do this. Um, yeah. We're supposed to yeah. finish the news again? Yeah. Okay. Um, Sorry. Okay, so I'd just like to point out that this is a drug that is approved without dosimetry, yttrium 90 zeppelin. But, and, and, but when it was first approved, it had indium scans to allow one to see if there was expected bad distribution. Uh, the therapy has been quite effective, it's FDA approved, uh, more effective than rituximab. And in, uh, when given its consolidation, it can uh, lengthen survival by 24 months uh, versus uh, no consolidation. No consolidation in, 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 the, uh, in the fit trial. So, 